come from the earth, or a phantom of night that has no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. I'm Dan. Hey, Dan. I like your sexy voice. Thank you, my my nighttime operator voice. Hey, Berber. I have I've a cold, clearly. I'm going to the doctor, actually, right after this recording. Do you think you have CV? I don't think I have coronavirus. I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. Because we were walking around Vegas, and I saw a lot of people with face masks on a couple weeks ago, and we did not face mask. I think I think I just have a cold. Okay. So I apologize for my my crazy cold voice. I like it. It kind of adds to a horror yeah. tale, maybe. Maybe you should just be sick all the time. I'll just be, yeah, it's awesome. Perfect. Just, I'll just You're be so fevery much... and achy and, and, and congested all the time. And moody. And moody. And moody. Well, of course I'm moody. I don't feel good. I know. Thank you for your continued ratings and reviews. Thanks for subscribing and watching on YouTube. Yes, we appreciate that so much. That's how people mm -hmm. find us. That's how the show grows. That's how we get it to a point where we can do live scared to deaths in haunted places. That, is that what we're doing? That's what I want. That's what I want, Dan. Can you give me what I want? I, I, we can do a few. We can do a few. See what happens? On top of my stand-up schedule? Well, like, for instance, somebody sent me an email, and they were like, hey, I saw the dance coming to Austin. There's this really creepy old place, blah, blah, blah. You, you could totally do a show there. I think people do do shows there. I'm like, okay. I okay. mean, it's not going to happen this year, but... Yeah, we can figure that out. It sounds fun. Fun. T t too many f I have too many fun things. So much fun. When time sucks, scared to death, stand up. We had a lot of scared to death. People come out to the shows in Brooklyn and D.C. That Thank was you. so much fun. Thank you very much. Thank Sorry you. Sorry about my voice for that show. I'm, I'm taking care of it. <laughs> You sounded great at those shows. I think you were more in your head about it. Than yeah, I get it. I get irritated. Yeah, if it's not how I want. I know. Now, if you can't, if you can't watch again, um, we'll put the pictures I talk about on Instagram and Facebook at Scared to Death Podcast. And um, yeah, oh, and, and merch, merch. We have uh, new merch in the store again. Such cool merch. I know it's. I, I you have love, a thing right here. I, I have a thing to show you guys, but I just want to say, like, I love being at Dan's stand up shows, helping him after the shows with the meet and greet, yeah, and just seeing. Our shirts coming through the line. I it's mean, very cool. it's very cool. Time sucks. Scared to death. The secrets suck. The stand-up shirts. Uh, Huge thanks to Logan and Kate. Oh my god, they're so good and so talented. So talented because like I can't draw at all. Okay, so you guys want to see what I have? I have switched up my blanket this week, which mm -hmm. is not blasphemy because I've got the scared to death blanket. And while Lindsay shows the scared to death blanket, we have uh, book related uh, items in the store. Right, we have from these from the from the book of ghosts that I'm holding right here, the scared to death book. We have um, framed wall art, duvet cover. It's crazy. All this stuff at badmagicmerch.com. And uh, I'm not doing a good so job of more. showing it because I bought the giant size blanket. So yeah, but it looks cool. We'll, we'll we'll post stuff on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna look good. It's gonna look good. That was my modeling. Okay, good job. Good job. What oh, it's so cozy. Now, how many fan stories do you have today? I have two, and I have one small one because I know that you said you have a big I have a huge one. Of course, story. when my voice is shot, I have the biggest story ever. Oh, man. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's but okay. it's a good one. It's a good one. Okay, well, let's, you know. I have two, I have, I, so you have two. I have, a, I have a small one and then like a regular sized one. Okay, I have a huge one and a little one. Okay. Uh, the huge, the huge one first. I just, I was thinking like if somebody just could like make a meme out of that. I have a huge like one, a little, a little like, one. I have a huge one. I have a little one. I have a huge mm -hmm. one. I have a little one. I have I, a medium one. I'm talking about penises, right? Yeah. Like it's like a uh, Goldilocks and the three dicks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What? Yep. Okay. So okay. speaking of dicks, no, not speaking of dicks. Uh, <laughs> The first story is the Enfield Poltergeist, supposedly true basis for the second Conjuring movie. Oh, okay. A movie that was released in the UK and Ireland is The Conjuring 2, The Enfield Case. It's a claim of extended and intense poltergeist activity lasting from 1977 to 1979. Wow, Tar that's a long time. Yeah, targeted at one family uh, living in Enfield, which is a nor northern borough of London. Oh, okay. The second story also takes place in the UK. Brief tale of one boy's encounter with, with what seems to be a shadow man in Leeds. In oh in Leeds last mm, night. Yeah, in Leeds, England. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't know what those are. He was wearing Leeds. I don't understand. <laughs> I'm a genius. Okay, so now are you, we're gonna get right into this uh, first tale. There's, no, yeah, there's really no setup. It just oh. goes. Yeah, no, no. As far as like, there's no like you know backstory. It just goes right to the scary stuff. Okay, we're going into the Leeds story. No, no, the, we're going into the big story. Big oh. story first. Little story second. Oh, I'm confused. Okay. Mm -hmm, we're switching it up. <sighs> 
really, you've got me off my game, Cummins. <laughs> and, okay. and and I will say, uh, big Darren trigger alert in this one. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I just oh, kind of, yeah. you know, do my thing. Protect H- myself. Huge Darren coming up. Well, you know how I feel about people being Darrens. You ready? I guess. I don't, I feel nervous. Time now for the tale of the Enfield poltergeist. 11-year-old Janet sat up startled in her bed. Something felt off. She looked around the bedroom she sometimes shared with her brother John, who was a year younger. Since he'd left for boarding school, she usually had the room to herself. But tonight he was here, and when she was woken by the sound of a chair shuffling across the room, she initially thought her brother was playing around. But what was the other noise she heard? The one she was still hearing. None of the noises seemed to be coming from John. When she looked to the bed beside her, John was fast asleep. Uh Uh-oh. In the other room, Janet could hear her mother putting her other siblings to bed, Margaret 13 and Billy 7. Janet then shook her brother John awake and asked him if he could hear the noises she was hearing coming from the shuffling chair. He blinked, listened for a moment, and then he nodded yes. He heard something too. The two kids exchanged glances, sharing, letting each other know that they both heard it, that they were both afraid. It sounded like whispering. The whispering attracted the attention of their mother, Peggy Hodgson, who came into the room with her arms folded across her chest. John and Janet were her two troublemakers, Mm. always avoiding bedtime, staying up whispering when she finally got them to bed. A few nights ago, they told her their beds were shaking. She was sure it was an excuse just to stay up just a little bit longer. What's all this going on, she asked. Something shuffling, whispered Janet, who looked alarmed. It sounds like the chair. Peggy shrugged and took the chair to the living room. Whatever made them go to sleep. At least now they couldn't blame talking to each other on the chair. When she got back upstairs, Janet and John were still whispering, so she turned the light off and leaned against the doorframe. She was tired. She was a single mother raising four kids. She was always tired. Uh Uh-huh, get that. Constantly worried about money. She also adored her kids, even when they wouldn't stop whispering and just fall asleep. She was annoyed, but she also had a smile on her face. Then she heard a noise that didn't sound like it was coming from her children, and she wasn't smiling anymore. She heard a shuffling coming from Janet and John's room. It sounded like a person walking around in slippers. Alarmed and confused, who could have snuck past her and entered her children's room? She popped in, turned the lights on, and saw that no one was there who, who, you know, no one was there who shouldn't be there. Everything was in its place. The dresser, the bookshelf, her two children in bed with their hands under their covers. The noises couldn't have come from them. While she was still trying to process what she just heard, she heard something else. Four loud knocks rang throughout the room. Knock, 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 knock. Janet and John snapped awake, their eyes wide in fear. They clearly heard it too. Then just as Peggy was about to open her mouth to reassure her children, maybe the Nottinghams next door were having guests over, something terrifying happened. An enormous chest, a heavy chest that Peggy couldn't move by herself, slid across the room a full 18 inches. Shut the fuck up. Then before her very eyes, it moved again, sliding into the doorway and blocking blocking her exit. What? Peggy cried out, everybody downstairs now. She grabbed her two children and some blankets and marched them to the living room. It almost blocked, but not quite blocked her exit. Right, right, right. I was they, thinking she probably like climbed over it. They were soon joined by their bewildered siblings, Margaret and Billy. Peggy quickly called her neighbor, Vic Nottingham. Her and her kids were close with the Nottinghams, Vic, Vic's wife, who was also named Peggy, and their son, Gary. Vic, who was a professional carpenter, often helped Peggy with tasks around the house. When Vic didn't answer his phone, despite it being late in the evening, she took her kids over to his house and sat just a few feet away and knocked on their door. When he answered, she explained what she had just uh, heard, what had scared them, and then with every word, she felt a little more foolish. Not knowing how else to help Vic, Gary, and Peggy, Nottingham decided to look around the Hodgson house. Peggy and her kids followed them, and when they were all gathered in the Hodgson living room, they all heard the knocking start up again. Oh my God, no way. Knock, 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 knock. The same sound coming from somewhere inside the house. Peggy Nottingham now called the police. A few officers came over to take a report. They were skeptical and anything uh, that anything had actually occurred, but they did do their due diligence and they searched the house from top to bottom. Was there someone hiding inside? Why would someone terrorize a family like that? Then they saw something, the chair. How is this happening? Nobody was touching it, but in full view of the Nottinghams, the Hodgsons, and the police. And the police. A chair slid across the room, wobbled, and then moved another couple of feet. Oh my God. By the time it stopped, it had moved four feet towards the kitchen in front of everyone. The police didn't know what to do. There was no intruder, not at least a human one. Something was happening, but no laws were being broken. They wished the family the best of luck with whatever it was they were dealing with, and then they left. Well, that's not helpful. 
What could they do? I don't know. The Nottingham, spooked and feeling bad for the neighbors, also could do nothing to help them. It was late, right? They had to get to bed, and so they also soon departed after the police left. Oh my God, at least let them sleep in your house. The Hodgsons, alone and scared, all piled into the living room. The four children and their mother slept close to each other that night. They hoped it was all over, but roughly 18 months of terror had just begun. My God. It was August 31st, 1977. Life would not return to normal until 1979. Even as they slept together that first night, something was harassing them. Something started throwing marbles and Billy's Legos at them from the shadows as they tried to sleep. Small toys hitting their arms and faces when they closed their eyes. The strange harassment continued for several nights. Something from the shadows, throwing small objects at them as they tried to sleep. How fucking weird is that? As if it was a prank. As if some mischievous teenage spirit was messing with them for a laugh. By September 4th, Peggy was at her wit's end. She wrote a letter asking for help to the Daily Mirror, a long-running British daily tabloid. Maybe they knew someone who would know how to help them. The Daily Mirror was interested. The deputy night editor, who worked weekends, thought visiting the Hodgins could make for a good story. Yeah, I bet he did think so. So he sent a reporter, Douglas Benz, and a photographer named Graham Morris to the house on 284 Green Street in the northern London borough of Enfield. Douglas and Graham spent almost a full day with the Hodgins. The house was a mess when they got there. Legos and marbles tossed about everywhere. Furniture placed in odd locations dumped across the house as though at random. They knew something strange had been going on. Of that they were certain. But they didn't know if it had paranormal origins. Maybe these kids were just allowed to do as they pleased. They didn't see or hear anything strange the entire day they were there. At around half past two in the morning of morning, or in the morning of Monday, September 5th, they went home. Peggy Hodson wasn't upset at all by the two men not seeing anything. She felt relief. Yeah, she probably got some good sleep finally. Maybe it was over, but she was wrong. She did not get some good sleep. The moment the reporters left, Legos and other small objects started being tossed around again, as if something had been waiting for them to leave. They struck the Hodgson children in their faces, and then the kids quickly began fighting amongst themselves, oh, no. positive that the siblings were throwing toys at them as a prank. Peggy ran down the sidewalk and grabbed the two men from the mirror. Graham readied his Nikon camera and ran back into the house. While he focused his camera, something sharp hit him in the corner of his eye. He Ooh. felt a pinch, and then a thin rivulet of warm blood trickled down his face. He and Douglas Benz both saw other objects flying about. Whatever was in the Hodgson's house, it didn't want to be photographed, but it did want to be seen. Graham and Douglas, like the neighbors and the police, had now also observed something unexplainable. But Peggy still hadn't got the help she desperately needed. The reporters had no idea how to stop any of this. The next morning, she called up the newspaper, spoke with a senior reporter named George Fallows. He asked Peggy if she wanted to move. Absolutely not, she said. She'd fought so hard to keep her children in one stable home throughout their lives, and she wasn't going to leave now. I mean, I get it, but come on, get the fuck out of there. The children's father was not in the picture. She didn't want to add further instability to their lives. I get it, but still. Fallows said he wasn't an expert in the paranormal, but he knew of a group who dealt with cases like hers. He suggested she call the Society for Physical Research. The Society for Physical Research, or SPR, dates all the way back to the 19th century in England. Founded by two Cambridge schoolmates, William F. Barrett, who studied physics, and journalism student Edmund Rogers, SPR began in 1881, with the stated purpose being to approach these very problems without prejudice or prepossession of any kind, and in the same spirit of exact and unimpassioned inquiry, which has enabled science to solve so many problems. SPR uh, has a lot of famous alumni, including fellows of the Royal Society, justices of the peace, members of parliament, a former prime minister, Alfred, uh, or Arthur Balfour, and notable scientists such as Marie Curie. Oh, we love Marie Curie. The SPR sent a man named Maurice Gross to Peggy's, Peggy's Enfield home, an inventor who patented, amongst other things, the rotating advertising billboard. He'd come into the world of paranormal investigation via personal tragedy. His young daughter, also named Janet, was killed in a motorcycle accident in 1976. After that, his family experienced strange events surrounding Janet's death. Clocks beginning to work that hadn't worked for years. Prophetic dreams. A powerful feeling of someone being near who they couldn't see, who could only be felt. Maurice arrived at Peggy's house on the afternoon of September 5th, 1977. Initially, like the two mirror reporters, he saw and heard nothing. Then on Thursday, September 8th, after spending three days around the Hodgson home, while everyone else was asleep, he heard a terrible crash. Uh-oh. 
He ran to 11-year-old Janet's bedroom and saw a chair jump four feet forwards and overturn. It twisted a full 180 degrees before falling to the floor. And then everything was quiet. He waited to see if it would happen again. And an hour later, it did. He left the house, satisfied he was starting to get to the bottom of whatever was happening. But would he, could he ever get to the bottom of something that didn't want to be seen? Something that didn't want to be controlled, documented, or forced to leave? He could document strange, unexplainable phenomena, but could he really help this family? The next day, the Enfield poltergeist activity escalated. Uh oh. At five past ten, a marble whizzed towards Maurice out of nowhere. A minute later, the wind chimes hanging on the balcony began swinging back and forth maniacally with no detectable breeze around them. So creepy. When Maurice walked down the hall a little while later, he saw the bathroom doors swinging open and closing on its own. No way. No way. He felt a cold presence near his feet, paralyzing him. The air around him suddenly felt sick, poisoned. What was this thing? What did it want? As Maurice investigated further, he realized that Janet was always at the center of the paranormal activity. Anywhere she went, marble shot through the air. Teaspoons lifted from the tables and fell to the ground and furniture shook. What did she have to do with all of this? When Maurice asked Peggy to keep an eye on Janet, Peggy was surprised and offended. She reminded Maurice that he'd seen the hauntings himself, that he knew there was no way Janet was playing tricks on them. That's not about tricks. He explained that he hadn't meant that Janet herself was consciously doing these things. But what if something had attached itself to her? Mm -hmm. What if something had possessed her somehow? Peggy remembered that Janet hadn't been the same these past few weeks. Her normally exuberant, outgoing little girl wasn't the same. Peggy struggled to say how she was different, though. She was changed, but how? Peggy couldn't quite say. She resolved to keep an eye on her youngest daughter. Maurice offered to reach out for more help. He asked author, journalist, and psychic and paranormal investigator Guy Playfair, who arrived on September 12th, along with Rosalind Morris, from a BBC Radio 4 show called The World This Weekend, to come over to the Enfield home and further document what they saw was happening. Mm -hmm. The investigators set up their cameras and waited. Around 11, Maurice, Guy, and Rosalind all noticed something about moving the marbles that no one had noticed before. What? They saw marbles shoot through the air, bounce off a tabletop, drop onto the floor, and then when it got to the floor, it suddenly stopped <gasps> completely. It didn't roll. Like it someone... didn't budge as if it had fallen in some glue. It just stuck there. Graham Morris, I mean, how could it do that? It's like defying physics. Graham Morris, the photographer... Oh, oh, a person was there holding it. Graham Morris, possibly. The photographer from the Daily Mirror had set up his camera hours before, but when he tried to get a photograph, the flash wouldn't fire. The picture he took just ended up being of some dark blobs. Making this much stranger, Graham's camera had been working just moments before, and then it worked again after he left the house. They all wondered if some strange energy could manipulate the camera's ability to function properly. It was all so very odd. Guy Playfair would stay in the house several more nights and witness many more inexplicable occurrences. One night, he saw Janet's empty bed shoot away from the wall towards her. At the same time, he saw a chair violently tip over as if someone had slammed it to the floor, except no one was standing near it. All while this was happening, one of the children's books flew out of a bookshelf and landed at Guy's feet. The book's title he saw was Fun and Games for Children. Janet then suddenly got an alarmed look on her face. Mom, she whispered, check your pillow. What? She knew with eerie certainty that they would find something in Peggy's bed. Guy and Peggy rushed to look at her bed. On the pillow was a small hollow, an impression, the distinct type of indentation someone would make as if they'd been resting their head on it. Oh my God. Guy said, we've got a little girl playing games with us. Peggy had been thinking for a while that the spirit of a child was in their home, trying to play some type of games with them, occasionally lashing out in anger. Guy told Peggy that if in fact they were dealing with the spirit of a child, there was probably nothing to be afraid of. Uh, doubtful. The kid probably just didn't know that they were dead. She probably wants to talk, said Guy, and doesn't understand why we're not answering. Just as Guy spoke those words, a loud scream ripped through the house. It was Janet. She was upstairs. They ran upstairs and found her cowering in a corner, a heavy chest of drawers upended with its drawers sliding out onto the floor, blocking her from exiting her room. Was some little playmate upset with her? Did it not want her to leave her room? Over the next few days, people outside of the Enfield home also started to notice odd things happening. Oh? Vic Nottingham, Peggy's neighbor, was leaving his shed walking past Peggy's garden one afternoon when he saw her curtains ripple. He thought it was one of the kids looking out the window, but then he saw her, and he felt sick to his stomach. Oh my God, what did he see? 
He was looking at a gray-haired old woman he'd never seen before, a woman with a twisted smile. Oh, God. And then this apparition just vanished. Who in God's name was this woman? When he told Peggy about her later, she had no idea who she could be. Maybe they weren't just dealing with the spirit of a child in their home. Hazel Short, a crossing guard, was passing by the infield house on her way to work one day when she also saw something strange. All of a sudden, a couple books came flying through the air and hit the window as if to get her attention. And then, after a moment, she saw Janet. She saw Janet levitating, going up through the air as if someone was tossing her. There was no way Hazel knew that she could get that high just bouncing on her back. It was as though something was grabbing onto her ankles and flipping her up. What the fuck? Janet herself would have no recollection of this ever happening. The investigators and Peggy decided to call in a medium. Someone claiming the ability to communicate with the dead. Someone who could try and make contact with the entity or entities that lived in the Hodgson's home. A medium and her husband, known by the pseudonyms Annie and George Shaw, arrived at the house within the next few weeks. As though feeling their presence was imminent, the night before they arrived, Janet started to cry in her sleep, and her family could ba- barely wake her. Oh, poor thing. Not even shouting in her ears would wake her. When she finally did awaken, she looked pale and tired, and then she hid herself away the moment the mediums arrived, as if repulsed by their presence. Weird. Annie settled herself in a wooden chair in the middle of the living room. George said a brief prayer, asking God to protect the house and them. Annie took a deep (coughs) breath, and then George looked her in the eye, and then his expression changed, hardened. His voice, which had been soft and kindly, moments before turned gravelly and rough, and things got very, very weird. Now, he cried, can you see me? Annie screamed, go away. She bared her teeth and started to laugh, her chest spasming as she heaved. You have to stop it, George said. He took a mirror from his pocket and held it in front of her. Annie spat at him. I've been spat at by better people than you. What the fuck? Look at this and see what went wrong. We can make it right. Help me, Annie moaned. Gozer, Gozer, Elvie, come here. What? You can get help, George shouted. We're going to take you away so you can have a peaceful life. See that door? We're going through that door. Try coming here and you'll feel that burning again. And then Annie's face suddenly went slack. Her breathing returned back to normal. After a few moments, she spoke as herself again. Oh dear, she mumbled. There are a lot of them. What? The Shaws told Peggy that Gozer was someone who had once performed black magic in the house. Elvie, they said, was an elemental who Gozer was forcing along with Janet to do things, what things they did not know. Sadly, like everyone before them, they did not know how to rid the Enfield home of these spirits. They told the Hodgins to focus on remaining calm and peaceful as much as possible. How about focusing on getting the fuck out? Any negative energy or anger or spitefulness could be used by the spirits against them. They felt that the spirits in their home wanted to upset them. They wanted to manipulate them and turn them against each other. They fed off of this negative energy. After the mediums left, the rest of the week was much quieter. The Hodgins visited the Shahs a a few more times to consult more about the ghosts. Overall, even though their home had not been cleansed of these spirits, things seemed to be getting better for the Hodgins. Yeah, well, not for long, I'm sure. And things didn't, uh, things weren't getting better for Janet. Janet was struggling. She, she hadn't been doing well in school recently and her grades were plummeting. She was falling asleep at her desk and snapping at her teachers and classmates. The school's headmaster called a meeting with her teachers and Peggy to discuss their options. The most obvious option seemed to be for Peggy to leave her home, but Peggy insisted they couldn't do that. One teacher suggested the family take a vacation. Peggy planned a trip to Clacton-on-Sea, an English seaside resort town on the Atlantic coast, the English Channel, almost due east of Enfield. They decided to leave on the 29th of October. And whatever was in this house was not happy about this decision. The spirit of the mischievous child, the old woman with the twisted smile. Whatever spirit or spirits were in the house did not want them to go. Furniture was flung about. The bed shook. Blankets were pulled off. Sheets were shredded into pieces. Oh my God. Bumps and knocks were constantly heard from the walls. Pools of water appeared suddenly on the kitchen floor with no explanation as to how they got there. More disturbing was that on closer inspection, the pools didn't seem to behave like a normal puddle of water. They had odd outlines as if drawn by a human finger. Oftentimes, the pools formed in the shape of a human body. What? And the most intense poltergeist activity continued to center around Janet. Janet showed paranormal investigators her school books, where her work would be perfect, and then equations and exposition would turn into a crude, jagged line, as if something had grabbed her arm and dragged her pen across the paper, which is exactly what she claimed. Janet was now becoming increasingly terrified to go to bed each night. On several different occasions, when she tried to go to sleep, she would feel a hand come from nowhere, cover her nose and mouth, and try to smother her. What the fuck? And still her mother Peggy would not pack up and move. Yeah, fucking she's a Darren. 
Not even after her daughter Janet walked into the living room one day and claimed to have seen an old man sitting in a chair. Janet said that the man noticed her, looked right at her, looked angry with her. She wanted to run, but her feet were frozen to the floor, and then the old man stood up and moved towards her with an unnatural speed. He moved at a speed impossible for an old man or any man to move. One second he was standing up out of the chair, the next he was upon her, putting his hands on her face, trying to smother her. What the fuck? Was this a spirit that was trying to smother her at night? Still, her mother would not move. Oh my God damn it, Peggy. <coughs> Another night, paranormal investigator Maurice was approaching the house from the subway when he heard a terrible scream and knew immediately he was coming from the Hodgson's home. He ran to the house. He had a key at this point, let himself inside, ran upstairs where the family's bedrooms were, and witnessed the other paranormal investigator, Guy Playfair, restraining Janet. Guy's cheek was bleeding. Janet was thrashing in his arms, wailing. She had just attacked him. Mummy, 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 she called over and over again. Her mother, Peggy, Peggy, stood beside her. The adults decided to call a doctor who arrived and gave her an injection of Valium. She fell asleep and Guy, Maurice, and Peggy went downstairs, hoping the worst was over. It was not. A loud crash from upstairs echoed throughout the house. The adults ran upstairs only to find that Janet, who had been in a deep, drugged sleep just moments earlier, had flung all the sheets off her bed, the blankets off her bed as well. She was kneeling with her head flopped over her knees, screaming. The next several nights this happened again. What in God's name? And then one night she stopped screaming and looked with clear blue eyes directly at Guy. Where's Gozer? She hissed in a voice that was not her own. He will kill you. The adults exchanged glances. Wasn't Gozer the name of the spirit that the Shahs had contacted? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then Janet's head dropped to one side and she was back asleep. The night terrors went on and on. Meanwhile, Peggy Hodgson was doing her best to provide a normal life for the rest of her family. Oh yeah, like that's possible. She was still trying to do her best to get her kids to school on time, make them meals, put them to bed. Spirit or no spirits, life had to continue. They still had to eat, sleep, and go to school. But it was getting harder and harder to keep it all together. Every night she could hear Janet being thrown out of bed hitting the floor with an enormous crash. Every night she heard her quiet whimpers of, Mummy, Mummy. It was terrible. She felt powerless. You're not powerless. Get the fuck out. How do you protect your child from something you can't see or touch? You move, dumbass. She felt like she was losing. Janet was getting worse and worse. She never felt quite there anymore. One morning, Janet began to draw. She took a pad of paper, some felt-tip pens, drew nine drawings very quickly. The first was of a woman with blood pouring out of her throat. Ugh. The name Watson written in large letters at the bottom of the page. The other drawings were of weapons, knives, guns, blood. Lots and lots of blood. Peggy quickly took the drawings and showed them to Guy and Maurice. Who was Watson, they wondered. And then the spirits began to also focus more and more of their attacks on Janet's older sister, Margaret, who was oh 13. One, na- one night, Janet heard Margaret talk in, the- in her sleep. She began to be plagued by nightmares, and she said, Go away, you ten little things running about destroying people's things. Another night when Margaret was asleep, Maurice put a sheet of paper in front of her and a pencil in her hand. Immediately she woke up and wrote the numbers one through ten. When asked who the ten were, she said, still asleep, number one is a baby, number two is a little girl, three is a big girl, four is a girl of fifteen, five is an old lady, six is a young boy, seven is almost eighteen, eight is an old man. She stopped. Number nine doesn't have a face. Oh my God. And number 10 has gone away. What the fuck? Then she exclaimed, Watson. Peggy had never told Margaret about Janet's drawing with Watson written on it. Who is he? Maurice asked. The man who died in the chair downstairs, Margaret replied. Then she quietly slipped back to sleep and wouldn't answer any more questions. When she woke up the next day, she had no memory of any of this. I mean, it's probably better that way. A short time later, investigators met Watson. On December 7th, 1977, the family was seated around the dinner table with Guy and Maurice present when they began to hear odd sounds coming from Janet's direction. Not from her directly, but from where she was sitting. Noises sounded like whistling, barking. Janet's mouth wasn't moving, but the sound seemed to emanate from her position. When Maurice asked if anyone else was present and if they were to announce themselves, and if they were to announce themselves, Janet opened her mouth and a deep man's voice rang out, Maurice Gross! What's your name? Maurice asked. Joe, the thing responded from Janet. Watson. Sorry, that was a mistake on my part there. I think that first name was supposed to be Joe Watson. I know, I was like, wait, what? (coughs) I I wrote that wrong, so apologize. Yeah, the deep voice rang out, Joe Watson. Did you live in this house? Yes. How long ago did you live in this house? No reply, only faint growls and grunts. 
After a moment, Guy asked, Do you know you are dead? Shut up! The voice rang out from inside Janet. She winced and covered her mouth and face with her hands. Listen, Joe, said Guy, you need to realize you are not alive. You are a spirit. You are a ghost. You are wasting your time. Why don't you move towards the light, where you will find others that can help you. You need to get off of this plane. As Guy finished the last sentence, the front door flung open on its own, and there was silence. Are you going to go away now, Joe? Maurice asked. No! We would like to help you, but you have to tell us what you want. We're not angry. When we know what you want, we can try to give it to you. Fuck off, oh, growled geez. Janet. And then the voice was gone and Janet started to cry. Over the next few days, Maurice and Guy tried to make contact with Joe Watson again, but they only got growling in reply. The low growling should have made Janet's vocal cords strained, but she never asked for a glass of water, never coughed, never had the raspy voice like I do now. <laughs> to eliminate the possibility that Janet was faking this voice, Janet agreed to let Maurice tape her mouth shut, and the voice continued to be heard. That's fucking weird. A few days later, a new voice was heard. Janet was used by another spirit to communicate with the living, the ghost of a man named Bill. He was 60 years old, had a dog called Gozer. Why are you shaking Janet's bed? Maurice asked. I was sleeping here. Why do you keep shaking it? Get Janet out. Get Janet out. Get Janet out. Get Janet out. My God. Bill, when we spoke to you on Saturday night, you said your name was Joe. Was there someone here on Saturday named Joe? Yes. So there are two of you? No, ten. Oh my god. What happened to you? I went blind. I had a hemorrhage and I fell asleep and died on a chair in the corner downstairs. Was Janet possessed? Were spirits just able to use her as a conduit to communicate to those of us living on this plane? Over the next several weeks, the voices continued. It was like multiple people trying to share the same microphone. Janet's voice contorting as though uh, she fought to keep up with the guttural tones pouring from her mouth. The voices continued to tell the researchers that they would not leave this house. Then something even stranger happened. How could it be more strange? One night, Janet claimed that while she was asleep, she began to feel herself levitating her room, floating up nearly to her bedroom ceiling. Then she felt herself pass through the ceiling and into the Nottingham's bedroom next door. When she opened her eyes, she was back in her bedroom, but she was convinced that what had just happened was not a dream. She ran next door to Peggy Nottingham's house, told her what she had just uh, thought had happened, you haven't been in my bedroom, Peggy said. But when she went upstairs to look, there was something small and folded up on her bed. It was Janet's book, Fun and Games for Children. Oh my God. On another occasion, Guy and Maurice asked Janet if she could leave something heavier than a book somewhere. They gave her a couch cushion before she fell asleep one night, told her to hang on to it when she passed through the ceiling. She fell asleep and then later in the middle of the night when she opened her eyes, the couch cushion was gone. Maurice and Guy searched the entire house, couldn't find it anywhere inside. Who's next door? Then someone spotted it from outside. The cushion, which was nearly the size of Janet herself, was on the roof. On the roof? What was happening? What was the purpose of all this? Why was any of this happening? Where was this all going to end? Janet was looking worse and worse. Yeah, this poor kid. She was pale, she looked sickly. Yeah, and a dumb mom who won't fucking move. She started waking up with bruises around her neck. <gasps> Once in late December, her mother was watching her sleep when she saw her nightgown rise up and twist around the young girl's neck. Another day, Janet looked her mother square in the eye as a voice emanated from within her. Get them out before Tommy gets a hold of them. He can be dangerous with a knife. Jesus Christ. Why are they still living there? When Peggy went downstairs the next morning, she saw a butcher knife laying on the last step. Yeah, of course. When Margaret went to the bathroom later that day, she saw written on the bathroom wall, I am Tommy. Oh my god. He's gonna kill them all. Still, Peggy does not move. Because Peggy's fucking stupid. A week later, Margaret was walking into the kitchen when she saw smoke pouring out of the drawers. She couldn't see anything burning, but the smell, the smell was overpowering. She fled from the room and asked Guy to investigate. They never found the source of the fire. Nothing looked burnt, yet the house continued to reek of smoke. She decided to bring in another medium. Gary, or Jerry Sherrick. I, a, I just think that she likes all this attention, this Peggy. Jerry Sherrick was a medium who Guy and Maurice had heard of, but never used in their investigations. He was a bit reclusive. They were able to get a hold of him, tell him everything they'd witnessed. Jerry agreed to come over and visit the Enfield house. He spoke a bit with Peggy and the children, did a full tour of the home. Then he sat them down and told them what he thought was happening. Speaking to Peggy, Margaret, and Janet, he said, Many lives ago, you were all together. You girls were sisters, and your mother was a lady of the town who had told you not to dabble in witchcraft. But you did anyways. You died, you slept, and then you were reborn. And you've been sent back here to correct the efforts of your dark magic from years before. 
Then he spoke directly to Janet, saying, Some people are born with the ability to see and hear others or things that others can't. They're mediums. I am one, and so are you. You are able to attract these nasty things and bring them in here subconsciously. They're not coming to you. You are bringing them in. And then Jerry's eyes rolled back into his head, and he slipped into a trance. He began chanting in a slow, unfamiliar language, then produced a string of names in English. Lil, Tessie, Dolly, Madge, Alfred, Alice. Peggy stared in disbelief. These were the names of people, close friends, and family who had recently died. What? Just how many beings were inside of her house? Jerry then fell out of his trance, returned to normal, left the house after urging Margaret and Janet to learn how to resist the voices. Under the guidelines he set for himself as a medium, he would only visit a house once. He would not accept payment. He gave his gift freely, on the condition that they were never to call him again. That's weird. As he walked away from the house, Peggy realized with a sinking feeling that this was their last hope. He had just told her that there were many, many people living in her house. Even worse, that the spirits were not being drawn in by her daughter. That she was, you know, attracting them. They were, they were like con, 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 a conduit for them. If Jerry was right, would moving even help? Would they just follow her? After Jerry's visits, things were quiet for a while, and then of course they weren't again. Peggy started finding random puddles in places water should have been able to reach. Janet began to see people walking through the house. She'd be in bed. She'd see someone pass through the doorway, peering in at her. One person or spirit or entity seemed to show up more than the others. The figure wore brown trousers, had a raggedy torn shirt. She noticed long fingernails curling yellow, Ugh. and then he walked with some kind of brace. When she confessed that she saw a person in their house to Margaret, her sister nodded solemnly. I see him too, she said. No way. The sisters also saw a child of their age, or the age of their youngest brother, floating through the kitchen, looking lost, wearing a white nightgown. Even when the figures didn't manifest as whole people, the girls could see wisps of shadow in the corners of their vision. Finally, in the summer of 1978, Janet begged her mother to move. I mean, it's been a year, my God. The poltergeist had been torturing her for nine months. Peggy couldn't, in good conscience, not take her daughter's request seriously. She also wasn't ready, for whatever reason, to leave the house. So on June 16, 1978, Peggy sent Janet to a girls' school run by nuns. A few weeks later, Guy was able to secure Janet a room at Maudley's Institute of Neuropsychology, where she checked in on July 25th. Everyone hoped that Janet's absence would make the house more peaceful. If she was the conduit, if she was the focus of the supernatural activity, maybe her disappearance would encourage the spirits to leave the rest of the Hodgins in peace. Doubt it. It didn't happen. Because what about Margaret? Over the next few weeks, even with Janet gone, Guy and Maurice often heard a child's laugh traveling to the walls. They felt drafts where there were no doors or windows open. One day downstairs, they both saw what appeared to be a man sitting at the table with his back to them. A man wearing a blue striped shirt and black trousers. As soon as they called out to him, he vanished. Despite Janet's absence, the house seemed to be more populated than ever. Seven-year-old Billy, who had never experienced anything before, one day growled at his mother while he played with Legos in his room. Awesome. Why don't you fuck off? Awesome. Awesome. See what happens when you don't get the fuck out? What did, you, what did you say, Peggy asked? Nothing, said Billy, and continued to play with his Legos as if he had no idea what his mother was talking about. Oh my god. Peggy didn't know what to do. The obvious answer was to move, but for reasons only known to her, she still wouldn't do so. She's a fucking idiot. She consulted multiple mediums, right? Two men, paranormal investigators, had practically moved into the house. Famed demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren had even come over to briefly investigate and were also unable to stop any of the activity. Janet had left for a period of time. They had paid for expensive hospitals to care for her. Still, the haunting continued. Nothing had worked. Finally, she decided to bring in a priest. Again, for reasons only known to her, she hadn't done this yet. A local Catholic priest came to the Hodgson home, did a cleansing, and then, just as soon as it had came, the Enfield poltergeists, or poltergeists, disappeared. All of it just stopped. Years later, Janet and Margaret would finally admit to playing with the Ouija board shortly before all the trouble began. Those little shits. If they would have spoken up sooner, could they have saved their family 18 months of anguish? After a year and a half of activity, the phenomena at the Enfield house was over, at least for the Hodgson family. After Peggy Hodgson died years later in 2003, Claire Bennett, another single mom with four children, moved into the house. Why? Claire herself never personally saw any entities manifest in the home, but others did, and she said she often felt like something was watching her. Her children experienced much more powerful paranormal phenomena. Her sons would wake in the night hearing people talking downstairs. Oh my God. Claire then found out about the history of the house two weeks after moving in and began making preparations to leave. Good. And then one night, Claire's youngest son saw an older man walk into his room before dis disappearing into mist. Fuck 
off. They left the next day. Yeah, that's what you do. The house is currently occupied by another family who do not wish to be identified. Speaking to reporters, the mother told them, I've got no children. They don't know about it. I don't want to scare them. Janet has been interviewed multiple times over the years. She continues to stick to her story. She continues to believe that whatever happened to her and her family was real. She said it lived off me, off my energy. Call me mad if you like. These events did happen. The poltergeist was with me, and I feel that in a sense, it always will be. Is she still haunted? I hate Peggy so much. She's definitely a Darren. Oh my God, she's Darren's fucking wife. Like, mm-hmm. like what? <sighs> I <clears throat> Okay, I get it. Single mom, the money asked. Like, I always understand that angle, right? I, I yeah. get it. But... She was also able to afford to send her daughter off to private boarding, or not boarding school, uh, a private mental institute. So, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, her reaction seemed to be pretty strange. She's very delayed in getting the priest. I mean, was she also possessed and and just didn't know it? Like it didn't uh, show up in the same way for her? Yeah, we don't know. But if, okay, if our kids are telling us, that there is something in the house. And I would kind of be like, okay, sure, yeah, whatever. Because, you know, I, I think that there is some sort of energy in our house or what have sure. you. I don't want that confirmed, though. Uh, if if they were not getting sleep, if they're being thrown on the floor, it's like her yeah. daughter was being harmed. She wasn't just saying, like, oh, I'm having bad dreams or I think I see a ghost in the corner. No, she's being uh, thrown around. She's being trapped in her room. It's trying to choke her. Right. Like, like yeah, why would you leave at that kidding point? kidding me? Huge Darren. She's worse than Darren. I, I think she's worse. Like the worst of the worst so far is Peggy. Right. If, if you don't give a shit about the welfare of your children, that's how far you're willing to go to stay in a house. Yeah. Right. You don't, you're not taking this seriously. You you experience uh, poltergeist activity for an extended period of time, and you won't leave. I mean, if you are just the worst, right. you are Peggy. One level down is Darren. <laughs> don't be a Peggy or a Darren. Don't don't be a. We need to mush their names together. A Darren Peg, a, a, a Peggerin. I don't know, but yeah, fuck man, I hate her. Well, here's here's some pictures. We don't have a picture of her. Good because I hate her. But we have a picture of her kids: John, Janet, and uh, Margaret. Here is this first picture. Okay. When they were, this is during the time of the John, hauntings. John, Janet, Margaret. Margaret's the oldest one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Margaret looks fucking terrified. And then, and then this next one uh, is the chair that Graham Morris, you know, th- saw move on its own, flip and it, over. It was so crazy that so many people saw so many things. Mm, I think it, that's why it's such a famous uh, haunting. Yeah. Uh, this next one is Janet allegedly being tossed through the air. Oh my God. Holy fucking shit. And here is Janet today. Well, a couple years ago, recently. Okay. And then, and then the last one is the uh, the Enfield Hodgson home. Just a little exterior shot here. So you know, it always you know like normal looking house, whatever. Yeah. And this is where all this stuff uh, supposedly happened. Weird. Ugh. And so people live there now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people live there now. And they have kids. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Because I, I got a little but confused. They're not, but they're not open to talking. To, yeah, they do. Yes, yes, they do have kids. At least as most of the most recent articles on. At least as as of a few years ago. There was people living there with kids who didn't want to. There was that one family that moved out. Yeah. Another family moved in uh, with kids and didn't want to um, talk about it, didn't want their kids to know what kind of home they lived in. I wonder how many kids they have. I don't know. I know. It's funny if it's four again. Right, right. Like if the house sort of draws a certain kind of family. Although now the family that's there now, do we know if it's a single mom? Uh I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything more details about that house. Yeah, because that's really weird that after Peggy and her family move out, another single mom with four kids moves in. Yeah, and it's a weird, weird uh, thing. Yikes. Okay. I did not care for that. This is a boogie one. Well, I don't want to rush this, but I feel like I only have so much talk left in my sure, throat. Sure, sure, sure. So I'm going to get, uh, I feel my voice fading a little bit. Okay. We're going to get to this next story. Okay, and then you can listen to my stories. And then I won't be talking much, but I'll, okay. be, but I'll be paying attention. I'll just run this show. There it's fine. There we go. Fine. I'm in charge. You Actually, you could leave. I could tell these stories to myself. <laughs> I'll stay. I'll stay. I saw something out of the corner of my eye. Oh, oh my yeah, God. Guy. Okay. So now for, now for a, a quick little shadow person encounter story. Great. Uh, also from the UK. Time now for the tale of the man on the stairs. 
the man this allegedly happened to said it occurred uh, in Liverpool. So I said Leeds earlier. You did. I, yeah. So sorry about that. Not Leeds, Liverpool. Sorry, when I was doing the prep for this, I felt like shit as well. I felt like shit for like five days. Super foggy and just not good. But you know what? If, if you're not happy with it, then fuck you. <laughs> Because I still worked. I could have easily said, nope, we're just not going to do a show this week. Calm down. So there we go. No one's going to be angry. <laughs> that was aggressive. I apologize. Yeah, okay. yeah. You're just, you just don't feel well. I do not. Okay. So the man this, this happened to said it occurred in, in Liverpool in the early 2000s when he was uh, just a kid of 11 or 12. One fall night, he and a friend were playing in the street in front of their house around 8 p.m. It was mid-October and uh, the clocks had just recently set back an hour. Okay. The sun had just gone down. It wasn't quite pitch black outside, but it was getting close. Sure. The parents of the kid in question had just left him and his friend to go run to the store, asked him what they, you know, uh, or asked him if they head inside, you know, stay inside yeah, while yeah. we go out. Yeah. They turned on the TV, started watching something they weren't supposed to. Of course. Raided the fridge, the cupboards, ate stuff they weren't supposed to. Mm -hmm. Having a good time being two young boys with the run of the house. Right. And then almost, uh, and then it's almost completely dark, turned to full on night. They started to hear noises coming from directly above them from the boy's parents' room. He and his parents lived in a semi-detached house, and at the time, no one lived in the other unit. Okay. So they knew the sound wasn't coming from next door. They initially ignored the noises, carried on, but then the noises gradually started to become louder and louder. What was going on up there? Soon they both agreed that they were hearing the sounds of someone's footsteps. But who could be up there? No one else was home. They would have heard someone else entering the house. Then they heard something being dropped. They started to get a little freaked out, each boy not wanting to look weak or scared in front of the other. They decided to go investigate. When they made it up about, you know, halfway up the stairs, the, the noises suddenly stopped as if whatever was up there had heard them. Now they were convinced someone else truly was in the house. Oh my God. They held weapons in their hand that they'd grabbed before marching up the stairs, uh, a hammer and a butcher knife. Tough little kids. Classic. You know, they were, they were going to be strong. They weren't going to be scared. They could handle what was ever, whatever was up there. They'd chase them out of the house. Make them wait while they called the police. Uh, they were also so scared they were starting to shake. By this time, they'd, they'd reached the landing halfway up the stairs, and then they could see their parents' uh, bedroom door, slightly ajar, and they didn't see anyone else inside. They took a moment to gather their resolve, and then they started to climb the stairs again. Just before making it to the second floor, the door to their parents' room, or to the one boy's parents' room, suddenly swung open and then slammed back shut. <laughs> With so much force, they thought it was going to come off of its frame. Fuck that. This was enough to break their courage. The two boys were out of the house in seconds. Good job, good job. In another moment, they were across the street, standing on a neighbor's front lawn, still clutching the hammer and the knife. Occasionally looking back at the house over their shoulders. They were hysterical. They pounded on the neighbor's door. Good job, boys. The man inside was a family friend. He agreed to head across the street and investigate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He searched the house from top to bottom, even checked the back garden. Nothing. Nothing, nothing was amiss. Uh, the two boys still too freaked out to go back inside. So they stayed out on the lawn. Soon the sister of the friend of the little boy who lived in the house came over to tell you know, her brother to come back home. The boy who did live in the house begged them both to stay until his parents got back from the store. Yeah, no shit. So now the three of them are out on the lawn, wondering what they'd heard. And then the sister suddenly points to the house, looking very pale. She said she'd just seen a dark shadow in the shape of a man walk past an upstairs window, and then impossibly the same shadow seemed to peer out from a downstairs window. Oh my God. Right, looking right at her, just not, not even a second later. When the two boys looked over, it was gone. Was she just trying to scare them further? The sister bolts off, frightened, runs back to her parents' house. And then the boys saw it too. Shit. While they were talking about what his sister could have seen, they both fell silent at the same time. They both were staring at the exact same window, later revealed to each other that they could each see a tall, long shadow of a man walk past the window and head towards the stairs. While they stared, frozen, the boys' parents returned home. When the car stopped in the driveway, both again were hysterical, trying to explain what had happened, begging the parents not to go inside. But of course, the parents did go back inside. They found nothing inside waiting for them. Mm -hmm. They chalked it all up to hysteria. You know, it's a couple kids having too much sugar, letting their imaginations run wild. The boy never saw the shadowy man again, but it did see him. What? On several different nights, he heard it. You know, after this event, he heard it walking up and down the stairs. He heard it walking up and down the hall. Several different times, he heard his parents' door open and shut when his parents weren't home. Fuck. And on at least one other occasion that he knows of, it came into his room and went near his bed. Uh. One night, he heard it walk up, uh, you know, or walk, you know, up to the outside of his door. He's laying in bed, 
waiting to fall asleep, looking under his door. It seemed suddenly as if the hallway had instantly grown much darker. Mm -hmm. He watches his doorknob begin to slowly twist. The door starts to swing open. He knows whoever is coming in is not one of his parents. He wants to run or scream, but he's too scared to move or make a sound, so he shuts his eyes tight. He didn't want to see whatever it was, and he heard it slowly walk over to the side of his bed. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. He felt a coldness emanate from whatever this thing was, this thing that was now in his room. He felt it look at him. He kept his eyes pinched tightly shut, and the thing just stood there for what felt like an hour, waves of cold seeming to pulsate out from it. What the fuck? He heard it then walk back to his door and shut it, but it hadn't left the room. He felt as it was, it was trying to trick him. It wanted him to see it, but he refused to open his eyes. And then minutes or maybe an hour later, that sense of something still being near him was gone. <sighs> it vanished, he opened his eyes, and he was alone. Okay. He later tried to convince himself it was just a dream, but he knows that he was very much awake. A few months later, the boy and his family moved to London. Yay! And he was all too happy to say goodbye to forever to the shadow man. Is that why you keep your eyes closed when you think there's something there? Maybe. I don't want to see it. Who knows what it could be? Here's a, here's a, a new artist depiction I found of what a, a shadow man could be. Ugh. Right? How did I like see that down, down the creepy. hall? That's terrible. Ugh. That makes me think about how Logan, who does our merch, had like a weird hallway experience in the middle of the night recently he was oh, texting yeah. us about yeah his wife was not happy to hear about that mm -hmm. yikes 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 well are so you now I'm, I'm handing the baton off to you yeah are you ready to just do some listening i am okay all right it's also very cold in here today are you freezing, I'm freezing. i am i am cold i mean i have my blanket so part of me is warm but yikes well do you want to get your squishy wishy yeah i'm good you got him okay i'm just yeah. gonna have a little sip of water here Oh, having your water. Okay. I'm ready. Okay, good. <laughs> no dead air on podcasts. That's like one of the rules. I, no, well, no dead air. I get that, but what do you do when both people need to drink? You'd fucking power through. You'd be thirsty. Well, it's not about being thirsty so much as it's about having to talk and not wanting to have like a weird thing sound from my... Perfect. You don't want me I to do it, it in, I get your, it. in your ear. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Do you know that we're in episode 24? Nice. Is that crazy? I know. It is crazy. It's cool. It is crazy. Because we've been doing this since September, and I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah. It's almost six months. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, I guess this is maybe my 24th episode now that I say that. Because I think I, I wonder if I started labeling them. No, this is, I think this is uh, 24. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I was nervous because I didn't do these in the beginning. So I was like, oh, wait, am I a liar? I think, I think you're right. Okay. Anyways, um... I just, I thought this first story would kind of uh, get us both just, we, we travel a lot for work and then, you know, our personal life and we rent Airbnbs and we stay in hotels and this is about a haunted house that someone would stay in with their family and I think it's a fucking terrifying. Ready? Ready. Ready. Where's your thing? Okay. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. My name is Trey and I'm a huge fan of the podcast. Thanks, Trey. I just started listening last week and I'm plowing through it. I love it. I just listened to the episode, Please Stay, and it inspired me to tell you about my paranormal experience from when I was a kid. When I was growing up, my mom's side of the family always took a big trip to North Carolina every summer. We always rented the same big house in the Highlands, North Carolina, that could fit my immediate family, my uncle's family, my aunt's family, and my grandparents. So a big fucking house, it, right? Yeah. A lot of people. Before I get into the details, I would like to explain the way the house is set up. It sits on top of a huge hill all by itself. You enter the house through the front door on the second story, which has the kitchen and the main living room. Okay. It also has a guest room where my family stayed and the master bedroom where my grandparents stayed. Then downstairs is pretty much built into the hill itself and has either, I'm sorry, and has a little game room and two more guest rooms each on either side of the downstairs floor. So like, you know, opposite sides, right? Yeah. One, uh, one room that my uncle's family stayed in and then the yellow room where my aunt's family stayed. Right across from the yellow room is a closet that goes into the staircase, kind of like a Harry Potter room that his uncle and aunt had in his house. Okay. 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 Yeah. 
So one day, all the parents and grandparents went whitewater rafting, and all of the kids stayed home while my older cousins babysat us. They were about 15, 16, and we'll call them Haley and Emma for the purpose of this story. I was probably about seven or eight. They slept in late in the yellow room, and by the time they woke up, the adults had already left for their adventure. I was already up, eating breakfast, watching TV, and I was with my other cousin who was the same age as me, Billy. Out of nowhere, we heard our cousins screaming and yelling from downstairs. Haley and Emma were very, very good pranksters, so that was what we initially thought was going on. We went downstairs, and they were opening and slamming the door to the yellow room. Me and Billy started laughing, expecting that they were messing with us. But suddenly, the door swung open, and we could see that both Haley and Emma were holding each other in their bed, sobbing. Yeek. Then the door slammed shut again with no one touching it. Billy and I sprinted to the door and could not, for the life of us, open the door. We pushed as hard as we could, but something on the other side would not let us open it. After about 30 seconds, we were able to open it, and Emma and Haley ran out. No one knew what the hell was going on, and for the rest of the day, no one went downstairs. Yeah. Another incident happened late one night. Everyone was asleep, and the window of the yellow room began opening and closing. My aunt was the first to notice and thought it could have just been the wind. Right. She tried to hold it shut, but whatever was moving it was too strong, and that didn't work. The slamming made everyone in the room wake up, and they all tried to close the window, and finally they did. They still thought it was the wind at this point, until the light in the bathroom turned itself on, and the door slowly creaked open. After it opened, the light shut off, and the door slammed shut, and then opened, and then slammed about ten more times, and then it all just stopped. So weird. They ended up moving into the living room for the rest of the night. Yeah. The next story is one that messes with me the most. Billy and I liked to dare each other to go and sit in the dark closet under the stairs for an extended length of time. We kept a record of who sat in there the longest, and whoever it was, was the winner. Billy always beat me, but this last time we played the game, I was not going to let him win. So I got in the closet, which was about as big as an office cubicle, and the doorway was about four feet high. The reason the closet was so dark is because there was no light in the closet. The only time you could see... The only time you could see in there was when the outside light crept in when the door was open. Okay. All that was in there was a small wooden chair and a rocking horse. So when my turn came for the game, I was planning on staying in there for a long while. And unfortunately, that's exactly what I did. Oh my God. After about 10 minutes sitting in pitch black dark, everything was totally fine, and at this point I had won the game. But I wanted to keep going so that my time would be even harder for Billy to beat on his turn. Sure. Billy sat on the other side of the door, and the only light that came in was from under the door where I could see just a little bit of Billy's shadow. He told me that he was hungry, and he was going to grab a snack really quickly and then come back. As soon as I saw his shadow leave, another shadow appeared. What? I asked who was there and no one answered. I cried out for Billy, but he was not there. I thought it could have been my dad, but he would have opened the door because he didn't like us playing in that closet anyways. And again, I called out, and there was no answer. Then, the worst part, I heard the rocking horse begin to creak. At this point, I was completely freaked out and decided to leave the closet. But just like the yellow room, I could not open the door. I was screaming for help through my tears, but no one came. The creaking of the rocking horse was getting louder and louder and faster and faster. I saw another shadow underneath the door, and I was knocking so hard and screaming so loud for whomever was there to help me. And finally, after what felt like hours trapped in there, Billy opened the door, and I could not have sprinted out faster. That was the last time we ever played that game. Oh my God, I bet. The last story took place the very last night our family was ever in that house. For this trip, my aunt's family did not want to stay in the yellow room, so my family said they would. And for the week we were there, nothing actually happened until the very last night. By that time, most people had already left. My aunt's family was gone, and my uncle was gone as well. My dad had gone back home early for work, so it was just my mom and my siblings in the yellow room and my grandparents in the master bedroom. My grandmother was awake in the middle of the night, tossing and turning, unable to fall asleep. Around three in the morning, she heard the sound of my mom screaming. She was calling out, Mom! 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 Help me! Mom! 
My grandmother sprinted down the stairs and burst into the yellow room, but we were all asleep, all completely okay. Weird. But on all corners of the room, from along the walls, were slugs. My grandmother said there had been 20 or 30 slugs on the walls. She swears it wasn't a dream because she never even actually fell asleep that night. The next morning, as we were packing up to leave for the rest, for the last time, my mom decided to look in the guest book. We had never, I'm sorry, we had been renting this home for the past five summers, but we had never looked in the guest book. Every single entry (coughs) in the guest book mentioned the ghost in the yellow room. What? So many people telling their own stories and experiences while in the house and what kind of activity had happened in the yellow room. Someone had even written a poem about it. Oh my God. We did go back to the Highlands quite frequently, but we stayed in hotels and other houses. We did go back to the other house just to look at it about two years ago, and the entire house was overgrown with vines. It looked like no one had been in the house for years. There was a beautiful garden in the back that was just completely covered in weeds. We couldn't even see through the windows due to the growth. Anyways, I thought you guys would like this story. Please feel free to share. I have never been so hooked on a podcast the way I am hooked on yours. I rave about it on a daily basis to friends and family. Thanks so much. Best regards, Trey. Trey, thanks so much for uh, the nice words at the end. There. I know, so lovely. That's so nice. I wonder, I wonder if Trey could send the address to that house. Like, um, yeah, where is it? Can you imagine? Like, I mean, I guess it's probably a private residence. You could be trespassing, but can you imagine staying in that little yellow room now when the house is like abandoned? Or just if you live anywhere near there and you want to go check it out, just take sneak, pictures. Which I guess technically might be illegal. So we, I, I cannot we can, we cannot advocate in, that. Right. But if you want to do that of your own volition, <laughs> that's your choice. Oh, my God. Cause, and, and that's the thing. Uh, I'm sure some people could do that. I mean, I, I get, you know, go back and forth with my skepticism on this kind of stuff. But I am definitely not skeptical enough to, like, to, like especially like by myself. No. There's no fucking way. I would go in that little yellow room. Especially no. when the house is abandoned and trying like sleep in there. Oh my God, that just, that make, that gives me such chills to even think about that. It makes me so sick to my stomach because also uh, I really hate slugs. I well, that's really, funny that your mind goes, I could give a shit about the slugs. Oh God, I just think I it would be, I feel slugs. like I would wake up covered in them like just. Ah. If I could pick between being covered in slugs. Yeah. And seeing a definite entity, I'm going to go slugs every time. I don't care about slugs. I'd rather see the entity. Because I think it's, I think it's very possible. You know, you know what it's you could real. do? What? If you're worried about slugs, what? Just bring a huge thing of Morton salt, <laughs> and just cover yourself in cover yourself in salt. Just make sure I haven't shaved my legs in the like past just, like, like five dumps days. So much salt all over yourself. It's a great it, idea. It'll, it'll rip. The, it'll like uh, salt kills slugs. I know. I know. When our daughter was more of a psychopath, she loved it when there were slugs, and she would pour salt on them, and she thought it was hilarious to watch them shrivel up and die. What? I forgot about that. Oh, she's. I mean, I think that like they learned about it in science or something because I don't even know Jesus how she Christ. knew that. Okay, well, I, I don't know. I don't know why I like why I react. I mean, I used to burn uh, bugs uh, alive all the time. I would get a WD forty and like uh, like a like a light or something, and I would just blow torch them. Why? Cause, I don't know. I just didn't like them. I mean, I don't like them either. But geez, felt powerful. Psycho. Mm-hmm. I was the god of the insects, mostly ants. I would I would light them up. Magnifying glass. Ooh, you know that game. I tried. The I mag- don't know that I, game. I tried the magnifying glass. Uh, I I didn't get it. I never did it no, with enough power. But I do remember this is so messed up. Just torturing one like carpenter ant that I, I I made his abdomen heat up a bunch. I think he died. But yeah, I tried to I tried to burn ants with a magnifying glass. I went through a sociopath phase for sure as a kid. I am so uncomfortable being in this small room with you right now. I did the slug thing too, guys. You did? Yeah, so she's not totally crazy. I was, I did it too. Okay. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not proud of it. Yeah, I think it seems like it's mostly boys who at least admit to it that I've talked to. I haven't talked to a lot of as many girls who go through that phase, but a lot of boys go through a cruelty to some type of critter phase. And some never get out of it. Some and escalate those, to cats. And some escalate to humans, and those are the ones you really got to worry about. Jesus. You guys are weird. You're weird, bro. Okay, bro. I don't even know what to say to that. Um, Okay, so this other story, uh, because I like to run, the story specifically spooked me because I actually think that sometimes when I'm running, I do think I'm like, is someone behind me? Like I have my headphones in, I can't hear, Mm -hmm. you know, like I feel like someone could creep up on me, maybe a ghost, maybe not. If I was in better shape, I'd I'd like to, I'd follow you around. Oh my God, that'd be such a great practical joke. Just far enough back that you couldn't tell it was me, just wearing a hoodie and stuff? Yeah. Just constantly follow you in your route? 
I'm like, God, but I know you. And I would, you'd have to have such completely different clothes. You'd have oh. to change your, and, and your you know, pacing. And you know I'm a creep. And so you'd be like, oh, okay. Right. And you'd be like, fucking Dan, knock it off. Okay. It would be funnier though if you could like if you knew someone had like the same route that they ran yeah. and you could cover yourself, but like maybe wear like slightly more like flowing clothes and just kind of like pop in and out, just yeah. like out of their peripheral. That would fuck somebody up. <sighs> it would. Well, here we go. Okay. When I was in high school, my mom and I were training to run a half marathon together. But because of our work and school schedules, we would train separately during the week and run together on the weekends. One Friday afternoon, I had walked to the start of the trail, and as I always did before I run, stretching, warming up, getting ready for the day's workout. Okay. I warmed up facing the road at the head of the trail. I turned to face the trail and start my run, and I heard rustling in the woods behind me. A scraggly-looking man in a bright red jacket, fisherman's hat, and hiking backpack stepped out of the woods a few feet behind me. Now, I thought this was weird because, one, a bridal trail is so flat it's not good for any kind of hiking, and two, I didn't see him while warming up. And not only did I have a clear view to the street, yeah. but it was March, and that bright red jacket stood out against the budding green leaves. How had I not seen him? Yeah. I decided to brush all of this off and start my run anyways. About a half a mile in, I meet a dog on the trail. So I stop, let the owner pass, just like you're supposed to. As I watched the dog go past me, I could see the man in the red jacket still behind me. How did this guy with a hiking pack that must have been 30 pounds of extra weight catch up with me at full running pace, a half a mile away from where we started? Yeah. I kept that in mind as I continued on my run. When it was time for me to turn around and go towards the start of the trail, I see that the man is still right behind me and I had no idea he was behind me. I didn't hear this guy behind me at all. Even though I and everyone else I met on the trail that day was crunching twigs and leaves and gravel under their feet, this guy in the red jacket made no sounds whatsoever. Right. I had to pass him to get home, so I gave him plenty of space, keeping as much distance as I could. So you're good with dogs, he asked, as he started to walk towards me. Can you help me with mine? It's right over here. He grabbed my arm and yeah. pulled me hard. I shook him off and ran the fastest sprint I have ever run in my life. I made it about a mile away on the trail, looked behind me, and there he was. The man was walking still, but yet somehow right behind me. What the fuck? As I kept running, I called my mom and told her what had happened and to meet me at the head of the trail. He kept pace with me until I reached my mom. I turned to point him out, but suddenly this man who had kept pace with me was nowhere to be found. Just then, the woman with the dog who I had passed previously on the trail yeah. came down. I told her, look out for the man who was behind me when I stopped for your dog, right. the one in the red jacket. She had no idea what I was talking about. She said there was nobody behind me when she passed me earlier. Weird. And in fact, I was the only person she had seen on the trail all day. That's a super creepy detail. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed, Chloe. Chloe, that's terrifying. Chloe, you know what? I'm I'm impressed by Chloe. Was it Trey earlier? Trey, yeah. Chloe, Trey, uh, everybody's story structure. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, in, in addition to sharing cool things, so many good uh, writers. Yes. Because it's one thing to experience, experience something, and it's another thing to convey that thing in a way that you know, like, makes it a good scary story to be told. Good job, you guys talent yep knowing where to place the details oh that last one because before that in my um uh asshole brain yeah i was just thinking maybe chloe's just slow as shit <laughs> of course you were so she's that. running her ass off but it's like she's running at a speed of this normal this other dude just walking like i thought she was just like a super slow runner uh-huh yeah she's sort of like does tiny steps and like yeah yeah it's like and just not she's not going very she's fast. Not making progress right i don't even know how that'd be possible dan some, some people are super slow but still, running is faster than walking. Not for some people. I've okay, seen it. I've I seen haven't, it. so I feel like you sound insane right now. I've seen some very slow runners. I mean, I've seen you run, so I guess... I'm not fast, but I'm not that slow. You're pretty slow. I am slow. Pretty slow. That's fair. Fair. But I'm not that slow. Do you want to talk about some presents that we got in the past couple weeks? Yes, we got this uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. We got this little scary, scary-looking gnome dude. Yeah, can, Yeek. You, can you reach I, him? I, I can grab him. 
and and the 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 fan. Oh god! <gasps> oh god! You knocked over Charlotte. What the Charlotte fuck, Dan? Pissed. Pick her up! Pick her up! Pick her up! Pick her up! Don't touch her! Don't touch her! No, do no, you know somebody sent me a picture of they have a doll that looks just like her, and I found out that they're called storybook dolls. Oh fuck! I was trying to show her. I was trying to show her gnome. He's ah! not a focus, but he's scary. Charlotte won't stand up. So we yeah so we got so we have that yeah and hold on there's and more we have, yeah so thank you guys very much for um uh the stuff you gave us and I think oh I, these paintings are so cool I forgot I think the fan who gave us that I want to say his name was Will his name wasn't on the box anywhere uh, that the gnome came in but he also gave me a collection that of course I'll be eating of Halloween peeps oh he was very sweet he was so sweet and I have on the fuzzy socks he gave me too he's a long long time stand up fan as uh, well so this was this, this, yeah. this gnome was also a nod to an old joke of some, mine about uh, gnomes in the driveway some some panda socks I just I can't. I can't today. I'm okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. So we got that. Um, also, I can help you stretch later. Help you make you more limber for the show. Okay. Okay. Sorry, just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> That's a nice offer. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Such a weirdo. Um, okay, but also, um, before I get to the paintings, we got. I, I again, I don't know. I'm pretty sure this is, came from Vegas. <laughs> oh my god, it's like, it's like a power pyramid or something. I know, I know. Uh, this is from a gentleman named Dan. That's and, pretty sweet. And then his son. I want to say his son's name was Caleb. Again, guys, names on things. And sometimes we're gonna mess up anyway. It's just you know it's the chaos of a of post yeah. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but they we, gave we, us but, so many things, right? They yeah. gave us presents for the kids. They, the fanny we, packs. We've seen them several times. I've seen them yeah. at stand up shows for a while. Super cool family. Yeah. So we got that guy, and um, and then also, so that was Vegas. Yeah. In D.C., yeah, in D.C., we got this selenite tower, which is a, a kind of crystal that I talked about uh, last week. I just, I have this book that talks about various crystals and what they're supposedly yeah. good for, and then I saw, uh, I stay out of our social media pretty exclusively, but apparently some people are fucking furious about crystals. Which is funny because you don't have to, if you just want to hear the stories, then just stop listening after the, you know, at that point in the show. Right. You don't have to listen to this part. You don't have to follow me on Instagram and listen to me talk about crystals. Right. Uh, you also don't have to get on there and call Monique a crazy lady. Uh, so inappropriate. We don't, we don't shit on people like that. So if you don't like that social media segment, which is separate of the show, this is not a show about crystals. We don't talk about it. It is a, in our opinion, a hilarious thing between Dan and I, because yeah. it's just funny that Dan like will not open his mind up to this. And, and Monique's not selling it or anything. Cause some, no. people, some people like our space lizards from time suck might get confused where it's like, we make fun of like wackadoodles, but we try and keep it to people who are making like claims of like, oh yeah, get this amethyst and you will levitate. Because right. there are people who go that far. Right. To me, that's the line. Or it's like, no, that's that's not, uh, there's there's no way that, that you can prove that. Right. You know, it's never, and even with like the scary stories here, uh, I'm not saying any of these things have happened. I'm saying people have claimed these things have happened. Right. That's it. Suspension of disbelief. So, so it actually doesn't oppose the logic I use on Time Suck. It's just, it's just a different kind of story, mm -hmm. a different kind of show. And you know when people get real like hard on crystals because I tease about it too and new age stuff. Sure, and that's fine. It's okay. But but what, what I find interesting is from my perspective, uh, you could do the same with all religion, right? You, you could know? tear it apart. So if you want if you want to have respect for your religion, you know, like that, in, in, in a certain sense, then you got to have an open mind with these other things too because it's all in the same category, right? Well, witchcraft this, is actually a belief system. Absolutely, and all of it is. Stuff that can't be scientifically proven, including all the scared to death story fodder. Right. So this whole show is about stuff that can't be proven. So I just like to entertain, you know, the possibility because it also can't be disproven. Right. You know, and you can't disprove that, you know, a crystal can make you feel a certain way or whatever. Like, I'm aware of that. Right. Right. And, yeah. and, and like, uh, obviously, all of you weren't there in line, but I was talking to a geologist. Uh, right, I right, want right. to say she was in Brooklyn. Or was she in D.C.? She was in D.C. She was in D.C. So it all starts to bleed together. Sure. Um, but she did say, she was like, listen, I've been a geologist for like 20 years and I don't feel any different. And sure. she she was, but she was laughing. She's like, you're nuts, but it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Kind of like you do you. So again, like, if you don't like any part of this show, like if after the stories, you don't like this yeah, banter, yeah. fine, that's cool. Yeah. But you don't need to... Uh, be tearing people down about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because again, we're and, not, and it's we're not, not constructive yeah. criticism to just nah. like shit on a part of the show that you don't like. And we're not promoting it in a way of like these things definitely do this. Right. It's just beliefs. The show yeah. is just about beliefs. You know, time suck is about analytics. 
about you know like the world of science because I will I will forever believe that there is the world of science and then there is everything else. I yeah, and I, I don't disagree with that. Right, but that doesn't right, mean right. I can't be open to the yeah, idea. Exactly. And I got this great email just while we're talking about it about the crystals. Um, I'll try to remember to include it in a coming week, uh, kind of like an update, not really a story. Yeah. Um, but this person was emailing and said, um, you know, basically how long have we had science? Like how long have we been understanding things? How long have we had the telephone, electricity, computers? Like sure. things change so fast and we're yeah. just learning. You know, it's only been a hundred years since this thing or that thing. Sure. I, I wish I could remember the sure. specifics, but we might find out in a hundred years from now that there's a different way to study rocks. Absolutely. And and then we might find out like, oh, uh, it can do this or it can yep. do that. I, I don't think that like by holding on to you know, any of these crystals, like you said, I'm going to levitate. No. And I don't think I, that's ever going to change. Right, right, right. But I know what you mean. And, and, you know, and, and actually, my belief has stayed the same, actually, if, if anyone is confused, where a long time ago in a uh, paranormal episode of Time Suck, you know, I, I said basically what you're talking about now. I talked about where, you know, it, we didn't know what little microorganisms were until pretty recently in human history. Right. People got sick and it was a huge mystery. And then we were able to see bacteria with a microscope. Yeah. There could be the bacteria equivalent of supernatural stuff that we right. just don't have the right microscope for yet. Yeah. Like I'm open to that. I'm, right. I'm open to that, you know, possibility. And, and that's what the show's about. So that, yeah. that's all. That's yeah. all. So just a little PSA on calm down about yeah, the fucking yeah. crystals. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is campfire stories. This is just interesting. This is a, this is a, a fun thing to think like, because what I like about this show the most is if any one of these things is real, yeah. not only are other scary stories real, but then who knows about crystals? Who knows about God? I just like that it opens up the, the, the door to magic to me. Right. Because I want the world to be magical. I can't prove it, but I would like it to be. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. I mean, what, what if we were so living... Fun. Like, uh, I've never done shrooms, but I just feel like when people talk about the things that they sure. see and that's like bright and colorful and everything's moving and everything's yeah. alive, like, what if that's a real possibility? I hope so. It'd be kind of cool. It's boring if not. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, so anyways, the, that pyramid. And then um, I got this salt lamp, which I've never actually had a, a Himalayan salt lamp. Looks cool. Yeah. So... I'm going to plug it in on my desk, but I just thought okay. I would want to show it off. I wanted to thank Ella. Yeah, that's she inc awesome. She included a whole little description about what it's supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think also you could probably lick it. So is it cool. just like a giant salt lick? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so that selenite tower just wanted to give a shout out to yeah. uh, Rich for bringing that because he also brought you some alpha male glasses, which were oh, hilarious. Yeah, so funny. I wish I would have had those for the White House. I'm so bummed I didn't bring them in my pocket. And then this artwork came in the mail to us from a fan, <laughs> a fan, a fan named Brent. So good. Do you want to show yours and I'll show mine, sure. or vice versa? Are we talking about paintings? Yeah. Do you sure. want to show off yours? Okay. I'll, sh <laughs> I'll do mine first. Now Brent said that you know this was inspired by a movie, and the movie is The Nun, which I actually haven't seen. Dan saw it without me, so I didn't see it. I saw it my sister. Yeah. But um. It was supposed to be me as the nun, and then he said the nun kind of took over. So scary. But I think that's you can so scary. I think you can still see Whoa. some of my traits in there. I yep. mean, that uh, is cheekbone, amazing. Cheekbone, nose, um, I, like the eyebrow, all that part, like oh, the yeah. bone structure. Oh, yeah. I think I've made that face at you before. So talented. So talented. And then yours is oh, from a Nick Cage movie, Mandy. Yeah, which I haven't seen. I haven't seen. It. I think Harmony said she saw it. I love this picture. I mean, it's oh my gosh, so yeah, great, amazing. Uh, thank you so much. This artwork is incredible. Yeah, so we're gonna find a, a good spot oh. for it. I don't think it'll really show up on the set just because of the way it's oh. focused in. But I'm sure these will go hanging in they'll the. Be, they'll be in the office. In the weird studio museum that we have going on here. Yep, yep, yep. And I, th I think that's yeah, th th yeah. I, think I, that's I would, it. I would talk more. Voice. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of just going. I'm gonna yeah. I'm, I'm let's wrap it to, up. Getting some medicine, hopefully. Yeah, off to the doctor you go. Yes. yes if he has yes. coronavirus, we'll let you guys know. Oh my God, I can't, I can't stop reading stories about it. I know. It's really... It scares me. It's scary. It's it's scary. It's terrifying. It's it's a lot of things. Yeah, so be careful. Wash your hands a lot is everything I'm yep. reading. I yep. heard that like the masks don't matter. Masks don't matter, but washing your hands a lot does. Yeah, and I read like a bunch of different articles and like one was saying it could be passed through duct systems and water systems like, like yeah. the pipes. And then uh, I just was listening this morning to NPR, this like morning 15 minute kind of podcast, like what's happening. And uh, a scientist... I, it's a specific kind of scientist that tracks diseases. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called. In China came out and said like... Epidemiologist? Yeah. What is it? Epidemiologist? Yes, an epidemiologist. Okay. Wow. How'd you know that? 
I don't know. Oh, that was good. Okay. Epidemic. I think that's right. I think that's right. Yeah. Something like that. Anyways, but he came out and said like this apartment complex in, I think it's in Hong Kong that they said they thought they had gotten it through the water pipes. He's like, that's not even possible. So, okay. so I don't know. I think that's like the big scares. Like we don't know how it's really being transferred. I heard sewers. So don't eat, don't eat poop. You guys. Sewers. I heard, I heard you come to the sewer. So you don't eat poop. Okay. And wash your hands a lot. What? Two things. Wash your hands. Don't eat poop. And if you eat poop, don't touch your eye because you don't want pink eye. Don't rub poop in your eyes. That's the, that's the main way you get coronavirus is from pink eye. From rubbing poop in your eye. Okay, cool. Cool story, bro. <laughs> please keep sending in your personal tales of terror to my story at scared to death podcast.com. For everything else, please email us at info at scared to death podcast.com. Thank you for listening or watching to uh, Scared to Death, a bad magic production. Thanks Thank you. to the team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Harmony Velicamp on social media. Joe Paisley producing and directing. Zach Flannery part of the team as well. Thanks to Sophie, Evan, uh, Sophie Evans. Oh my God, my voice is dying for finding more creepy stories. Thanks to Joe Paisley, Zach Cohen, Jeffrey Montoya for the sound beds, Heather Rylander for taking over the My Story at Scared to Death Podcast.com emails. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, at Scared to Death Podcast. Subscribe to Bad Magic if you want to watch the show. Enjoy your nightmares. Creeps and peepers, please continue to be scared to death. Bye, guys. Love you. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but has no home here within scared.